Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we're unable to get to them during the presentation, they'll be answered at the end. My name is Braden Knudsen. I'll be your host for this webinar today. We'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website as well as onto the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel so you can rewatch the recording later if you'd like as well. Um, today we'll be pleased to hear from James Tanner who will be giving a presentation titled Locating Your Ancestors Exactly from Maps and Gazetteers. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research as an, and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoiced to be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. So we'll turn the time over to James now and let him take it away for us. Howdy, this is James Tanner. We're here with uh, a new webinar from the BYU Family History Library. And we would like to remind you that all of these webinars are being recorded and uploaded to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. That's on youtube.com and you search for BYU Family History Library. We have about 195 videos right now and we should be having more as this month progresses. Uh, today we're going to talk about locating your ancestors exactly from maps and gazetteers. This is kind of a favorite uh, topic for me because I have uh, found over the years that uh, exactly means exactly. You really do have to locate people down to as, sometimes as close as the house level. What that means is this. A lot of people have the same name. So names are pretty difficult to differentiate people and we'll talk about that a little more but the uh, and dates dates are usually kind of approximate and can be wrong and off and all sorts of things but the one thing that is important for locating genealogical records is the exact location where a, where a person lived or an event occurred so for example if you uh, if you have uh, uh, ancestors who are from Scandinavia or if you've ancestors in England or Wales or Scotland or any uh, practically any country in, in uh, Europe uh, and many other places around the world uh, such as Latin America the number of people with the same names can be overwhelming and when you begin to investigate these people and try to differentiate between one Jose Gonzalez or another John Smith or uh, Richard Jones, then the only way that you're uh, ultimately going to be able to tell the difference between these people is by locating exactly where certain events occurred in their lives. Um, of course, we look at the primary events like birth, marriage, and death, but uh, other events are also important. Even a land sale or a, uh, a, a job uh, or other type of activity that can tie the person to a specific geographic location may, um, may be of assistance in separating out people uh, and, and furthering your research. Um, so basically what happens in most instances is that people are looking for the missing puzzle piece. Um, one of the things that I get uh, uh, that are kind of uh, difficult for me to comprehend is people who come in and talk to me and, and show me a fan chart, one of these charts where there's a person in the bottom and it comes out looking like a, a fan of, of ancestors. And they point to an empty spot on the fan chart and say, well, I'm looking for this person. And my answer is usually, well, who are all these people below that, the, the descendants of this person? And they say, well, I don't know. And, and I'm interested in that other person back there. And I'll say, well, until we know that you have who all of these people are that are the descendants that come down to you, 
uh, you have you don't really know whether or not you're related to that person who is back there in that uh, vacant spot on the on the uh, fan chart. So the important thing here is uh, most of the issues that we have in finding the right person in our in your ancestry involve finding an exact um, location. Uh, so so from this standpoint, if we look at it. Uh, Here's, here's kind of the example that I would give. Um, a person comes to me and they say, um, my ancestor was born, uh, we've been looking for this ancestor for years and years and years, and he was born in Kentucky, and uh, we just have never been able to find him, and, and do I have any, and ask me if I have any suggestions. Well, the, the question I ask is, okay, well, when did this person supposedly live in Kentucky? And they say, oh, 1750. I go, well, where have you looked? And they say, oh, well, we've, we've done extensive research in Kentucky. I, we've been to, to courthouses. We've been all over the place. We've hired researchers. Uh, we've done all this research in Kentucky. And I said, well, why haven't you searched in Virginia? And they'll say, well, why would I search in Virginia? My ancestor said he was born in Kentucky. And my answer would be, well, perhaps you didn't realize that uh, Kentucky didn't become a state in the United States until uh, 1792. And uh, the 1792 uh, makes, before that, the Kentucky was a county or territory of Virginia. So all the records would probably be in Virginia. Uh, of course, that generates another discussion between me and the person, and and, uh, and we get into a longer discussion. The other one that's even more common, actually, is one that's come up within the last couple of weeks here in the library at BYU, is uh, the one where they say this. They say the same thing about, we're looking for the ancestor, and I say, uh, and where in this case, it's usually an immigrant ancestor. And the immigrant, uh, they, I ask where they uh, say the immigrant was supposed to have come from, and they say, well, he came from Germany. Uh, and when did he arrive in the United States? Back in 1845. And I go, well, how do you know he came from Germany? And they usually refer to, uh, in this case, the, the patron pulled out a whole stack of paper and started showing me uh, census records that recorded from the 1850, 1860, and 1870, and 1880 censuses that all said that the ancestor came from Germany. And I said, well, where was Germany at that time? I don't think you understand that Germany as such did not exist. Well, why would they have put down Germany if he wasn't from Germany? And my answer is because he spoke German. Uh, or some language that sounded like German to the census workers, but they had no idea what they were talking about when they put down Germany. Um, and it could be one of any number of duchies or principalities or countries or uh, empires that existed at the time, uh, depending on the time involved. So we get into that. That leads us into looking at maps and looking for additional records and, uh, and and finally, usually, usually the people get to the point where they begin to understand that they can't simply go look at German records and find their ancestor, uh, whose name is Heinrich Schmidt or something like that, Henry Smith. So this is the this is the idea, and and most of the issues we find over the I found over the years where people are unable to find the ancestor it, are resolved when they figure out that they're looking in the wrong place and that uh, once we find the, the place identified with more particularity. Um, uh, another good example is, is a line of ancestors that I have presently going back in uh, the Family Search Family Tree that I've just started to work with and correct. And I find that uh, we have uh, a list of people who are in Virginia, uh, supposedly my direct line ancestors, each of succeeding generation going back was born in a place called Shepherdstown, uh, Virginia, uh, which is now in West Virginia, by the way. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, the dates go back long before Shepherdstown was, uh, was founded as a, as a city. Now, it may have been that they lived in that area. 
Uh, but uh, most of the history that I look at says that the first settlers to get there were arriving after the time when these uh, ancestors were supposed to be born in that location. So um, this is, a, this is a, a real issue of identifying the exact location of, uh, of some event. Uh, now, uh, all I can say is that we do have the tools. Now, one of the considerations that we uh, need to get into when we're, when we're talking about locations are um, our maps and other uh, geographic help uh, indexes called gazetteers. A gazetteer is a uh, listing of geographic places, uh, usually with other information, uh, sometimes population and, and economic and commercial information, things like that. But uh, the gazetteers that we're interested in as genealogists list a lot of place names. And we'll talk about a few of those as we go along. Um, but one thing that's important to remember is that, the, that although in, in genealogical circles we often uh, worry about how many documents, documents have now been digitized, What's, what do we have available that's digitized. And uh, there are always somebody willing to point out that, uh, oh, there's, uh, you still have to go out and look in uh, courthouses and look at paper records because not everything's been digitized. Well, with maps and gazetteers, uh, there, there's minute uh, record of almost every spot on the place of the earth and including historical places that uh, no longer exist, uh, towns that are now uh, been dis that are long gone, or or places in the West where there uh, are ghost towns and things like that. So we need to understand that there are just hundreds of thousands of maps that have been digitized, and uh, because of satellite views, we now have a, a complete mapping of the of the entire world, uh, probably many times over. Now, we're looking here at a record that I picked up out of Family Search Family Tree. And in that record, this goes back on my direct line ancestor. I went back a ways and, and uh, found this entry. Uh, a John Tanner, who is a male, whose birth is not here, whose christening's not here, and who is dead. Um, and uh, uh, assumedly buried, but nothing here about a burial. So how do we know who this person is? Well, the answer is this type of entry does not identify a specific person. There's no way in the universe that you're going to find this person without uh, additional information. Even if you have added his name onto the end of a pedigree on the assumption that he is, his child uh, was the same name or that the first son was named this or something. Uh, that gives you some justification for speculating as to the name of a of the next biological parent. Um, so basically, what I do in these circumstances to show people uh, and illustrate the problem is to go to the program called FindMyPast.com. Uh, Find My Past is uh, primarily UK records, so it works well with uh, the United Kingdom. In this case, this John Tanner would have been back in England by that time. Uh, so this is supposedly before the uh, mid-1600s that this person lived, back in the, almost the 1500s. So we're going to look here on, you know, on Find My Past to see how many John Tanners there are in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, on the records of uh, my heritage, millions of records for all of the different, covering many of many years, most of the years of, uh, if not all the years of the United Kingdom, uh, and back before the United Kingdom into early, even earlier records. So uh, here we're looking in the UK records, and we find that there are uh, 28,000 John Tanners in the findmypast.com records for the United Kingdom. So if you only have John Tanner with no identification, you've got one out of 28,000 uh, possibilities of, of hitting the right person. Um, that, you know, is not very good average in my book. And, and the chances of hitting the right person are very slim. Um, and the only kind of information that we could add would be a specific uh, 
information about the specific place where an event occurred. Now, uh, interestingly, um, I was doing this with one of the, the patrons here in the library recently, and and the uh, and we had a common name like this, like John Tanner, which is a relatively common name. And uh, we went to the parish, to the, the like very small, couple of square mile area of where the around the church, and uh, found in this particular case that even giving the birth date and making the search within two years, either way on the birth date, there were some 1,300 people with the, the exact name of the ancestor in that one parish. Uh, so, you know, this is not uh, not helpful unless you can even get more specific and find an event that ties a person to a particular house or farm in many cases. Uh, so how would you ever know you had the right one given these kinds of odds and given the uh, number of people that may have the same name as your ancestor? Uh, what I suggest you do is you go to Google and you search for each place in your family tree, not just names, but looking for places. Um, many times uh, the information about places that I find in family trees is garbled. Uh, uh, differences would be, for example, uh, having the name of a street or the name of a uh, farm or even the wrong name of uh, the county and place of uh, or province or state or whatever of the uh, of the location that they may simply be wrong. So in this case, what we're doing is uh, we're going to go into Google and see if we can verify um, the existence or the uh, correct uh, designation for a specific place in in uh, someone's pedigree. So right now, and here in Google, the I have to understand that places should always be written from the smallest to the largest jurisdiction. So when we're organizing our place names in uh, our, our family trees or our, our other records, we should make sure that it starts with the, the smallest area. Uh, in some cases, uh, our farm plus a village, town, or a city, uh, then move up to the next level of a county. Now, it, depending on the country, these may be have these may have different names than than we see here. Uh, then uh, the next would be the state or province or the district, and then finally the nation. Uh, another way of doing that would be like the house or farm, and then to a parish, uh, either either a ecclesiastical a church parish or a uh, civil parish, and there are both types in England, for example. And then the next level would be uh, a county, and then the state, province, or district, and then once again the nation. But the idea here is always going from the smallest to the largest uh, uh, jurisdiction, meaning the, the area of, of where the government has subdivided the country into managing into governing bodies. So in this particular case, uh, for example, when I was talking about finding the, the house or farm, what I've said to many people for over the years because of my own personal experience in doing research in Scandinavia, that uh, I, I would maintain that if I looked carefully, I would find as much as 80% of all of the names that various people have received recorded for their Scandinavian ancestries are wrong. They simply are not recorded accurately. Um, I've made that comment for years now. And uh, in one case, I was sitting in a classroom, and, uh, and one of the ladies uh, in the classroom said, oh, oh, Mr. Tanner, you make some of the most absolutely ridiculous statements. And I go, oh, really? And she said, yes, I have all my at genealogy here from Scandinavia right here in front of me and, and we've been correcting and doing this for years and let me just show you as an example and I said sure give me a name and of a place and let's see where it is and so we uh, so she gave me the name and we worked through it I was right there on a computer and I started looking it up and 
the first thing I said was, well, the first name you've given me is a street, and the next name in the order that you've given me is a uh, is the county, and then you give me a, the name of a farm, and so forth. In other words, the the places may have been in some cases accurate as to uh, what some event that occurred in the life of the person, but the order in which they were being entered was wrong because whoever entered the names did not understand how this places from small to largest jurisdiction was supposed to work in that particular language and country. So this is really the, the issue, is coming up with more accurate place names. So another reason why we would look out, look in all of those, uh, put all of our places in our database into a Google search would be to make sure that the places exist. Um, this is, you know, this picture gives you some idea of how difficult it might be to get down to the house level in some countries and determine where somebody lived particularly if there are even addresses or streets or anything else. But um, the, um, the, in this particular kind of situation, but it's the same almost everywhere. Uh, you really need to get down to be very, very specific about whether or not the place even exists as such. Um, For example, here's an one of those sources were for his birth, so the record uh, is, was not complete there. And um, there's some other, this hasn't been worked over very much. Uh, in, the, in the birth place, it has Maitland NSW Australia. The, the NSW is uh, very likely New South Wales. And down below the 28th of July is uh, abbreviated. The July word is abbreviated as J-U-L. Uh, what, what this indicates to me from the family search family tree is that the information in this particular record came from people working with paper family group records uh, many years ago, probably more than 20 years ago or, or plus, and that uh, the reason why is because abbreviations, uh, the, the records that were being kept were on paper, and the place where you could enter an abbreviation was extremely small, and so the, um, the record, the, the people were required to use abbreviations, and so you see things like NSW as New South Wales, and um, also the abbreviating, uh, abbreviation of the, of the uh, date in the 28th of July of 1894. Okay, so the, the important thing here is to understand that, that uh, we need to verify this. And because there's no records uh, attached to this person, uh, verifying a birthplace and date in Australia, then uh, it would be something that I would need to check. And the first way to do that is to put New Maitland, New South Wales into a computer search program and hope that somebody uh, finds out where it is. So here we're entering Maitland, New South Wales into Google. We do our search, and we find that there is a Wikipedia page for Maitland, New South Wales. Now, the important thing here is that uh, we understand that, new, that Wikipedia, uh, this huge online sort of encyclopedia, has uh, attracted people to enter places, uh, and, and currently just about every populated place in the world uh, has been recorded in Wikipedia. And uh, it was not surprising if uh, Maitland, South, New South Wales existed that we would find a Wikipedia page talking about uh, history and uh, other factors in the, in the life of the people who live there. Now, if we focus on the upper right-hand corner, it says coordinates. It's pretty hard to read. You might not be able to read that on the screen, but 
the up in the corner, here's the coordinates. Uh, what you see there are the the regular coordinates or English system coordinates, 32 degrees, 43 minutes south, etc. Um, if you click on that in the Wikipedia um, article, click on the coordinates themselves, it takes you to a page called the GeoHack. Now what that does is it takes that geo, that what Wikipedia extension kind of program, takes that, uh, those coordinates and searches them throughout the internet and brings up a list of all of the websites where that particular, uh, those particular coordinates appear in the website. So what we have here is a, um, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, what we have here is a, a listing of probably a, a few dozens of sites uh, that would tie into this geographic location. And then up here at the top, we have uh, the decimal coordinates. Now, what we saw before was the degrees, minutes, seconds. That's kind of the traditional way of doing um, points on the face of the earth, but these are the decimal coordinates. And there's plus signs and there's pl positive and negative numbers. And there are positive and negative uh, east and west of the prime meridian and north and south of the equator. So if, for example, if you were living here in the west or in the part of the United States uh, as a child and you decided uh, to uh, get out with a shovel in your backyard, and dig a hole to China because you'd been told if you dig far enough, you'd hit China. Uh, this is the proof. Uh, what you look to here is if you find your coordinates in um, in the United States or particularly in the Western United States, and it has a positive number, you change that positive number to a negative number. It will it will then put that uh, geographic location on the other side of the world and show you where you'd come out in China if you actually did dig all the way through to China. So just in case you wanted to know, you're able to dig your way through the center of the earth. But what, it been, what I'm trying to say from that is that the minuses and the pluses are important to keep track of in this particular way. Now some of these websites that are listed here uh, tell all of the information about um, a particular geographic area. So for example, we have a GeoNames is a website that's listed down there. And by clicking on the satellite view, uh, you'll get a, a satellite view of that location in uh, the GeoNames uh, program, which will also uh, associate uh, uh, all of the uh, geographic names that are around that particular location that you've that you've found. So we're going to go back a little bit here. Uh, we're looking at what's called a geohack. You get that by going to uh, looking up a place in Wikipedia and uh, type the name of the place and then put the word Wikipedia and it'll come up if there is one. And if there isn't, go to the next larger place next to it uh, in the uh, geographically speaking. And uh, then you come to what's called the geohack. The geohack is a listing of all of the locations on the internet that have um, that particular location. Um, and uh, it, there can be dozens, uh, uh, even up to a uh, hundred or so uh, websites out there that also talk about that same location or have maps or whatever of that location. Now, um, if we if we look at that now, if we copy that decimal coordinates that show up here, that gives us the decimal coordinates. Uh, then we can um, let's see. So copy those decimal coordinates, and we paste that into Google Maps. Okay, so you go to Google Maps, um, and when you paste that in, Google understands those coordinates. And as soon as you paste that in and hit enter, uh, you will be taken to the location of those coordinates. In this case, we're over in Australia in the place called Maitland. Uh, there's a Kmart there, so it must be a, a little bit substantial place. And uh, now we know that Maitland, New South Wales exists, 
and that's the point of this because uh, the, so many of the it's, it's not infrequent that uh, the place names that have been kind of traditionally recorded in the families uh, particularly if you're looking at an entry in a new uh, some for some place on a family tree or a, a shared family tree or whatever like uh, a family search family tree that the place names may not be uh, accurate um, so what we've done here is we have verified that Maitland is in New South Wales and then we can proceed from there uh, to uh, to see if there are records that tie that birth date that we had in the family search family tree to this location. Uh, we had two issues, by the way, with those uh, records that were for um, uh, my ancestor in Maitland, New South Wales, and that was that the um, that not only did we not know that the place whether the place existed without looking it up. Um, but we also didn't know whether or not any anything had been anything had happened in that place since there were no records for that person uh, that referred to his birth in New South Wales. So, so part of that is now going out and looking to see if uh, those records do exist. Now, it's not uncommon for this to happen from uh, from records that are transmitted from ancestors because. Uh, it's only recently that we've had any uh, possibility of uh, doing research in places like Australia um, if you lived in in Arizona, Utah or someplace. So depending on where you lived, if you lived in Australia, obviously you could do research there. Um, now another part of, of what I do on the Google is to go down to Street View. Now down in the corner, right-hand corner of the Google Maps, there's a little guy that looks like uh, it's called Pegman, and Pegman can be pulled out and plopped down on the map someplace, and it will take you down to the street view of, of all the places that Google has driven with their little Google cars. And so uh, I always do this routinely with every place someone is talking about in order to get an idea of what it looks like. Uh, I, I do well with visuals. Uh, I like to uh, know what I'm looking at or be talking about. And I can see whether it's a countryside or farm or a, a city or a big city or uh, where it is that we're we're going to try to find the records. And, and a city like this, a nice um, looks like a nice suburban type uh, area, uh, would probably have quite a few records, and we'd be able to uh, to find some of the ancestors. Particularly since this particular this ancestor lived back in the mid 1800s, which is a time period covered by a lot of records. And a, and the bonus here is that if you happen to know the address off of a census record or a parish record or some other record that records the house, like in Scandinavia, a house census, um, then you can go right to the address of that person and see the either the house that they lived in or uh, see the uh, place where the house was located if for instance it happens to be a vacant lot now okay now once you have this information it's important to correct the entry and I'm using an example here again from familysearch.org uh, and the family tree but in this entry uh, we see that the NSW abbreviation that was a holdover from the paper family group records uh, needs to be corrected and uh, you can do that uh, in this particular view by putting your cursor at the end of the word Australia and then uh, clicking, uh, put the insertion bar there, and then hitting the space bar on your computer keyboard, and that will then give you the option of adding in uh, the full citation for Maitland, New South Wales, Australia. Now, if that uh, if your place is is something that does not exist uh, presently, but but is like for instance a county that's been absorbed into another county or uh, some kind of other geographic reorganization, uh, then you don't have to accept that as a standard to change if if your actual birthplace was was at the time that it occurred the place was different, then 
as family search has a, a, a provision for adding that as a non-standard uh, entry and simply all you do it to do that is to enter the words and then click off the area of this of the um, contained in this record so off to the side off of the record itself and that will then register the correct birthplace at the time uh, and allow the computer to connect it to the geographic location represented by the standard. Okay I know that's a little complicated but uh, there are pretty extensive instructions on the, the, the familysearch.org help center part of the website uh, and uh, available through the tips down in the lower right hand corner of the family search website that will help you to to make those uh, changes. So here's what it would look like 14 December 1839 Maitland now New South Wales Australia. And once again I'd emphasize that you actually do need to verify the exact place of every event. It's very important for that to happen. Okay, now, <clears throat> just, uh, and I, I'm probably going to say this a number of different ways, but I'm hoping that uh, at least one or two of the different ways that I say this um, uh, help to, you to understand or help anybody to understand that uh, the first step in any research is to, genealogical research, of course, is to identify where a particular event occurred. Um, uh, we're not looking for names so much as dates so much as the places where an event occurred because, and the reason is this, the records are created at or near the place where an event occurs by someone who is either interested in the event or has a duty or obligation to record the event. And so uh, without, a, uh, without fastening, if you will, fastening an event to a place, so that you know where that event occurred, there's no way you can find the record for the event. Um, I was talking to some uh, some people earlier today. Uh, the example, the question was asked me about locating a marriage event. Uh, a person who lived in California married a person who was living in Utah, and this is some time ago, um, and uh, not a long time ago, but uh, not recently, say in the 1940s and maybe 1950s, early 50s. And in this case, the question was, uh, they've been looking for a marriage event, a marriage record in um, California and also in Utah. And I suggested that they start looking in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, because uh, that was uh, a place where people would go to get married. And if they were actually from these two different places, it would not be unusual that they end up in Nevada. So there's, uh, there are, in fact, there's a whole classification of places like that called Gretna Greens, G-R-E-T-N-A, G-R-E-E-N-S. And those are places where people go to get married, either because the requirements to obtain a marriage license and get married are, are less stringent than they are in the area where they live, or because the, uh, there's some other advantageous reason for going there. Uh, people, for example, go all the time uh, to um, uh, Las Vegas in the United States and sometimes to Atlantic City and sometimes to Niagara Falls for that matter. There's, these are all sort of destination locations where people could have gone uh, to, uh, to get married and it make it very, very difficult to find a marriage record unless they happen to tell somebody that they did that. <laughs> okay, so here's another question that comes up. What happens if the place does not show up? <laughs> In other words, you're looking for the place and you're looking for the place and you can't find it, uh, perhaps because it's no longer there, but perhaps it's also because you are... Um, looking in uh, for something that doesn't exist because you have the wrong name or the wrong place. Okay, so let's, let's kind of illustrate that. Uh, the, the solution for it, in, in, fact, in part, is uh, a website called the USGS, United States um, 
Geological Survey Board on Geographic Names. Um, we have a tendency to want to say Board of Geographic Names, but it's actually Board on Geographic Names. It's been around since 1890, and it was uh, established to gather all of the geographic information of the uh, world for the benefit of the United States Armed Forces. Well, we also get the benefit of their, we their website. Now, what you can do here is to do a search for a domestic name search, and uh, it will search through all of its millions of records of domestic names and put a, out a listing of all of the information that they've been able to find uh, and locate on all the different places that have that name around the country. So in the first case here, you're going to be putting in a name in the search field, and then you're going to put a type if you want. If you don't, it will look through all of the types. Um, and the more information you give, the obviously the faster this, this uh, program is going to be able to find your information. But on the other hand, uh, uh, you don't have to put in that and, in it and choose a type uh, if you don't want to. You can also enter state and county uh, information. But, uh, and I would recommend that because if you just let it go for the whole United States, you may wait for a long time and find dozens and not a couple of hundred places named exactly the same thing, and it might make, create a problem. So in the first instance, before this becomes an effective way to find place names, you have to have done a little bit of research to localize it down, at least to the, um, to the extent that you found a um, state or a county. Now, this works also in foreign countries. The program isn't quite as straightforward. Uh, you can translate that into it becomes a lot more difficult to do searches in foreign countries than it is in the United States. But they do have the same type of list for all the places uh, historically and otherwise around the world. So if I were, for example, looking for Porcupine Creek or Porcupine Draw or something like that, then I could do this and look through the whole in the United States, and it would come up with, in this case, Porcupine Creek comes up with 422 different uh, geographic locations around in different states uh, that have the word porcupine in the title. Um, I, I, sometimes I'm doing things like this, and then somebody will say, well, you know, it's called Porcupine Flat. And we'll put that in, and nothing will come up. And we'll look again, and we'll look again. And, and finally, I'll find it, and I'll say, yeah, except it's badger flat, not porcupine flat. And they'll say, well, I knew it was some kind of animal. I just couldn't remember exactly which one. Anyway, so you know, there's all sorts of things that happen here. Uh, but, it, but with this listing, is, is an almost exhaustive listing of, of uh, every geographic place. And, Almost consistently, well, consistently, when I can't find it here, it turns out that the name was slightly different or quite different. Um, the question comes up as to whether or not we should use the name of the place at the time of the event. The answer is yes. The genealogical standard in this area is to use the place name as it was at the time that the event occurred. And what this means is that if you have a, a date before uh, 1776, for example, on the eastern coast of the United States, that they did not live in the United States of America. They lived in the British colonies. So you can say Massachusetts, you know, British colony of Massachusetts, or however you want to designate. Uh, I think I've seen a couple of different ways of designating the colonies. Uh, if you were, an, if you happen to have lived here in Utah and uh, you were born in 1847, right after the pioneers arrived in the Utah Valley, uh, then you would have been a citizen of the state of Deseret. And uh, within a couple of years, you would have been in the territory of Utah. Uh, if you got here early enough in 1847, you could actually have been in Mexico. Uh, so there's uh, some different areas depending on the time uh, of the event that occurred. Let's move on here. Okay, now, what about changing place names? Uh, one place where that becomes a real issue is names 
uh, that uh, uh, people that uh, places in Poland. Now, if you if you know anything about the history of Poland, you know that it's been overrun uh, a few times, both from the east and the west, and uh, basically vanished as a country. And then it's come back, and then it's vanished, and then it's come back, and so forth. Well, this is an example, and I I not particularly focused on this one uh, website, but it is a representative website of many, many websites out there that list, uh, make lists of German, uh, Polish, and Russian names for the same location. So one place in Poland could have three different names, a German name, a Russian name, and a Polish name. And these websites let you search by the German, Russian, or Polish name to come up with uh, the place uh, as it was called at the time that you um, are looking to to record it. So here's an example of from German to Polish. And then if we come here, uh, I guess I did another German to Polish list. OK, now I mentioned that uh, that there are a lot of maps online, and even though there are some rather uh, large identifiable holes in the in the overall genealogical research records that are that are available online and and fully digitized and and even indexed, uh, maps are kind of the exception. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of maps out there that have been uh, mapped and detailed. Uh, detailed studies made. So in this case, we have a program called Old Maps Online. That's all together, uh, .org. And what that program does is it lets you type in a place name or uh, actually draw a rectangle on a map. And it will give you all the maps in its uh, database of over 400,000. I think there's even more than that now, uh, maps. Uh, in this particular database. It's not actually a, a solid database. It's actually a portal. It links you out to websites that have all these maps and searches them. So in this case, you choose a map. And I put in a place called Nutrioso, Arizona. And now it shows me that the uh, like Google map view of Nutrioso. And on the right-hand side are a list of all the maps from all the different years that would cover that same area of Nutrioso. So uh, finding a map with old maps online is basically the process of looking at what the computer will find for us. OK, so here's another map. And this is the, the, um, the description of the map, just to give you an idea, 1877 map. Um, uh, and it, this particular was a mapping expedition from the United States Army. And the commander was Lieutenant George M. Wheeler, uh, Corps of Engineers, U.S. Army, and had some uh, ge ge uh, genealogical uh, assistance along with him. <laughs> and an interesting thing about this is this the, the map people who back there in the 1870s were, were combing around Arizona uh, were able to and uh, managed to get their names attached to some of the geographic features. So in Arizona, the highest mountain in Arizona is called Wheeler Peak. And it was George Wheeler at the Corps of Engineers, the first lieutenant who was the person who mapped that area. Oh, Humphreys is the highest, I'm sorry. Wheeler is actually uh, a high peak in the, on the, on the uh, border of um, New Mexico, I mean, excuse me, Nevada and Utah. Um, I was uh, thinking in terms of what I had climbed, and I climbed Wheeler Peak um, and was having a brain lapse there thinking I was in Arizona when I was really in, in Nevada. But uh, uh, Humphreys is the same thing. It's Humphreys Peak, the highest peak in Arizona, and Humphreys is uh, also named after another Either political figures, they named them their patrons, the people who were in charge of the, of the geological survey, or they named them after the survey officers. So everybody kind of got memorialized in the names of, uh, of the various people out there. Sorry about my uh, 
geologic, geographic memory lapse there for a second. Um, uh, now, this is a different kind of thing. And I was illustrating here gazetteers. And a gazetteer uh, is a listing of places, uh, usually very detailed list. And this is one that's very helpful. It's called the Myers Ort. Uh, and our Myers Orts, um, and uh, it's a lexicon of, of German uh, empire places, very detailed. In paper version, it's many volumes long, and uh, it has been incorporated in a in the database online uh, in a number of different websites. So if you go on and search for the Myers Gazetteer or Myers Orts, O R T S. Uh, then you will find a listing of, of uh, quite a few different copies of this particular volume. In fact, it's incorporated into Ancestry.com uh, as uh, one of the uh, collections that they have. So you can search it there on Ancestry. But these are not Ancestry. These are off of Ancestry. In this case, if I go to search for a location like Berlin in uh, a different part of Germany, not Berlin, Germany, the big one, but another Berlin, Germany. Uh, there are a number of them, and this is Berlin number three in the Myers Orts. And uh, it will then show a listing of all of the information and giving you the correct order of the jurisdictions and how the place should be uh, listed. So this is kind of a, a a very uh, detailed standardization place name place for uh, for for Germany and the countries that ended up being part of Germany or uh, subject to Germany at some time or another. So there's full translation and mapping of the Myers Orts uh, on uh, the good. That's all good news. Uh, the bad news is the original entries are in black letter German. Uh, script, so they're a little bit harder for people to learn uh, to read until they get used to it a little bit. This is another map example. This is a, uh, a what's called an ordnance map, not ordinance, but ordnance. And an ordnance map is for prepared for the army or ground troops use, and it's to tell them where all the buildings are and where all the roads are and where everything else is so that they can plan uh, their movements through a particular part of the country. And in this case, this one is back in 1887. And an interesting thing that you can do is compare this exact map with the same Mac map put together in 1938. You can see which buildings have moved and, and which ones are still there, and uh, gets a really good overall view of, of the land. Uh, that you would normally consider to be in a um, aerial view or a uh, satellite view. These are actually drawn, obviously. OK, well, we appreciate your watching here today. Um, remind you that these uh, webinars are uploaded to the BYU Family uh, History Library web, web uh, YouTube channel. All these webinars are going to appear there. And we appreciate you being here today and uh, appreciate you also subscribing to our YouTube channel. Excellent. Thank you very much, James, for the wonderful webinar. And we thank you all for, for being patient with some of our technical difficulties today. Um, let us know if you have any questions. Feel free to type those into the chat box now if you do have any questions. Um, we would like to remind everyone again that these are being recorded, as James said, and you can go to our... BYU Family History Library webpage as well as the YouTube channel. Um, There's one question, question, by the way. We'll, we'll hang on here. Um, it says, how do you get to GeoHack? You go to any place you want to find, look it up in Google, and put the word Wikipedia after it. These are all in Wikipedia. In, up, in the upper right-hand corner, you click on the coordinates. So if the coordinates appear, click on that. It will go to the GeoHack for that location. So it's uh, pretty simple to get to. I don't, uh, you know, I suppose there is a direct address to it, but um, you've got to look up a place before you actually get there. And um, 
Yeah, and then there's a note here about uh, uh, different land places in uh, Germany that say that uh, Ancestors was born in Galicia, Galicia, and it was known as Aust Austria, but now is the Ukraine, and they're Ukrainian. Okay, well, that's the problem, and you've got to know which, at which point in time the place was created and where the records would be. And to subscribe to the YouTube channel, just go to the YouTube. It's Y-O-U-T-U-B-E, YouTube.com, and look up BYU Family History Library, and then there is a big checkbox that says subscribe. That's all you have to do. Oh, okay. Um, can you read the places Australia uh, that would make the the uh, assumption that they're Austra Austrian? It would not be Austria at the time anyway. It would, if it were anything about that time period, it would be the Austria-Hungarian Empire, and uh, that would be the actual location. But it would be better to put in all of the Ukrainian uh, places, the actual village where the person was, and then indicate that at the time where it was part of what empire? That would be the answer to that question. Okay, any more, anything else? Got it. Okay, well, if we have any other any more questions, we'll go ahead and end for the day. Make sure you go and check our website for our calendar for our upcoming webinar so you can participate with us next time. Thank you.